I think a big thing that the Fed is focused on, a, a big thing that will impact global economies just in the next year, forget like five years out, is the productivity gains and the disinflationary impact from AI. I think it's going to come way faster than people realize. And that's kind of why the Fed, like that could drive the super cycle. Because if you're the Fed and you're saying, look, last decade, we couldn't get any inflation despite QE and zero rates, the most productivity generating technology in generations coming in an accelerating way over the next year or two, like, is your bias going to be that like, this could like that, that we could get into like an inflationary environment again really quickly and you need to like be tight on rates? Or is it going to be, man, like we could have a big disinflationary dynamic coming into play really quickly and, and we need to like keep liquidity out there? This episode is brought to you by Monad, which has not only the highest performance EVM L1 architecture ever built, but also the wildest and craziest community in crypto. Monad's internal devnet is live and public testnet comes out soon. So make sure you join the Monad community today at discord.gg forward slash Monad, M-O-N-A-D, Monad. Hey everyone, Santi and I have been talking about Solana a lot recently, and we're excited to have a Solana sponsor of Empire, Marinade. Marinade is a staking protocol on Solana and the only stake pool that delivers auto rebalancing MEV rewards and automatic downside protection with their new protected staking rewards. Optimize your sole stake with Marinade by hitting the link in the show notes. Big thanks to Marinade. We'll talk more about them later in the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Empire. Uh, we will miss Santi today. I think he's skiing or something like that. But uh, huh. either way, we uh, we have we have better replacements for Santi today. We've got Jake Bruckman, who's been on the show before, uh, CEO, co-founder, managing partner at CoinFund, and then uh, lucky to be joined by uh, Seth Gins uh, from uh, also from CoinFund, managing partner. So Seth, welcome to the show. Jake, welcome back. Thanks. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, Jake, I actually thought a, a primer on Coin Fund, which we really don't do these primers much, um, would would be helpful here, um, because I was so I was at this thing at a uh, where Seth, where were we? Pen Blockchain thing, and we we're at this event, and he was telling us about the Liquid Fund. I was like, I didn't even realize Coin Fund had this huge Liquid Fund, and I oh, yeah. and we had um, uh, I was talking to David the other, just talking to different people at Coin Fund. I don't think people people know Coin Fund for being very early. I think you guys launched, if I remember. Brooklyn 2015, like even pre ICO era, like very early mm -hmm. coming up on your 10 year anniversary. I don't think people realize the extent in this, uh, to which coin fund has become this like behemoth of a crypto fund, I would say. So maybe Jake, you can give us the lay of the land at coin fund right now. Totally. Um, well, I think it depends how you define crypto funds, but by some definitions, we would probably be like the first crypto fund in the United States. Like there's definitely like people in the market making investments in crypto in 20, like mid 2015, whatever. But I don't know if there were like a ton of um, fully crypto dedicated. What, what about funds. blockchain cap? Blockchain cap. That's yeah. They were, they were quite, they were quite early as I, well. When I think of Pantera, early crypto funds, it's like you guys, Pantera, blockchain cap. Those are who I think. Pantera like had a Bitcoin early. fund. Yeah. In, in 2013. Well, in any case, um, we, we, we are, we were quite early and I think the, the way in which we had differentiated at, in, at that point in, in like 2014, 2015 was me basically, you know, growing up with Bitcoin between 2011 to 2015 and then asking the question, what other applications are there for blockchains and blockchain technology and decentralization technology? And if you like, if you had go, if you, if you went back and read the coin fund white paper, there weren't even there wasn't even a concept of smart contracts in that in that white paper um, because everything was just in terms of cryptocurrency and you know the idea was like let's you know duplicate what Bitcoin did and like you know if we if we need a new application right so we've come like such a huge long way um, I started Coin Fund in J our track record begins July first twenty fifteen officially so we're going to be nine years in a couple months here um, that's pretty crazy. We um, started with a team of just like two people, like me and my original co-founder, like Alex Bulkin. We've now grown to a firm of about 30 people, about 20 or so of them are in New York, 
Uh, I'm down here with our head of platform, Jenna Pilgrim, in Miami. Um, Co-founder, managing partner, Alex Felix, is in Boston with another person on our investment team. And we have a few people here and there. Um, we, the lay of the land of Coin Fund is we have three sort of investment programs. One is seed, one is venture, and one is, is liquid. I tend to spend most of my time on the early stage uh, seed program. And that's where we're investing out of a $158 million fund, which we announced uh, last summer during ECC. And you have Mr. Gins, who runs our liquid program. And David Packman, who's not, in, not here with us today, is our head of venture, uh, looking at kind of series A and B opportunities in a 320 or so million dollar fund uh, as well. So that's kind of the lay of the land. And, you know, one of the, the things I'll quickly throw out in there, like what what's different about CoinFun is you you have this awesome so jake like engineer super early in the space saw the development of the ethereum ecosystem out in brooklyn like i, I we, we need to find a way to support this and then you look at the other managing partners going across the firm so david who, who jake mentioned he was at venrock like top traditional venture for over a decade um, he he led uh venrock's partnership with coin fund back in 2018 so very early to, to crypto as well. Alex, who Jake mentioned, was private equity and uh, and joined Jake early on. I was 18 years public equities investing and uh, got into crypto in 2012. And then Chris Perkins was co-head of Futures Prime Brokerage at Citigroup. The CFTC was his regulator. He's on the Global Markets Advisory Committee at the CFTC. So you you have this like, and, and you know, long, long time crypto investor as well. So you you have this great like crossover blend between traditional finance perspectives and uh, and really crypto native perspectives. Mm. Yeah, I remember I remember when you guys hired Pac Man. I was like, man, uh, like it's kind of Web two legend coming over to join Coin Fund. And then Chris was in our office uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was like, wow, like I didn't even know about Chris. Like this is kind of a cheat code <laughs> to have him in house. And then we we met. And I was like, man, I got a stack team over there. So yeah, it's pretty cool to see. By the way, to David's credit, it's not that he just got into crypto in 2018 with the coin fund investment. He was doing crypto. He was looking at crypto companies years before that. He, did, he was actually he mining. Did Dapper, Ether. Right? He, is, yeah, he yeah. did. So he did. We did Dapper together. But even before that, um, David was, I think in like 2016, he was mining Ether like with his son and stuff. Mm. And David is an engineer by, by, by background. That's why one of the reasons we like. Mm. And then Evan on the research team, Jenna, yeah, stack, stack team over there. So, okay, so seed fund is what, 158 million, you said, ventures, couple, 300, did you say? 320 how, how big or so. Roughly is, Jake, I heard, um, I heard Chris Dixon from Andreessen talking on a podcast the other day about there's kind of two different um, strategies in venture. There's kind of like, tru- I'm going to botch this, but like heat seeking and truffle hunting, I think it was, <laughs> um, where... Tr- I, I think he needs maybe to improve that slightly, but uh, uh, because it's not fully obvious what, what the strategies are when you say it like that. But heat seeking is like you're basically trying to win the big deals that everyone's chasing. There's in crypto, this might be Monad, it might be Bear Chain, it might be Eigenlayer. It's like everybody wants to lead the Eigenlayer round, everybody wants to lead the Monad round. Like, let's pitch and get this, you know, be able to lead the billion dollar round because we know at some point they're launching a token that's going to be, I'm 50 billion or something. So yes, billion dollar valuation is high, but 50 billion one day. So that's like, I think what Chris would call heat seeking. And the other is truffle hunting, which is like, I'm pretty sure what he means by this is like, you know, you're kind of in the forage, like scavenging and you're trying to find these things before like that nobody else can find in the world. And you're trying to find those. What is the, I guess if you had to identify the strategy of coin fund, like which bucket do you fall into? Yeah. Um, I don't know which of those we fall into, but I'll just tell you, I actually had a, th- a tweet thread on this where I like asked myself that question and then, and then gave the four things that we look for. And it's basically the idea is to be like early, technical, long-term and right. So I think technical means that like I, as a, as an early stage investor, I'm very interested in the bottom up understanding of technology. I'm not necessarily going to be as deep as some of the experts who are building the thing, et cetera, but I have a, a, at least a functional understanding about like what the, you know, what the tech that's being used there is, 
why is it good? Why is it competitive with other technologies? What are like the threats to it long-term? What are the advantages to it long-term? Um, and historically, like we've been early, right? So we, I mean, for various reasons, one, one reason was just like happenstance, got to see crypto like much earlier than most people learned about Bitcoin in 2011, but other reasons were like being early to the DeFi space and really seeing the potential of smart contracts and creating new types of public goods, new types of, you know, fi finance protocols, cutting out the middleman, et cetera. Or another area that we often uh, had gotten a lot of credit for being early in was NFTs. Is the idea of like putting digital co collectibles on chain. And when I saw the very, very first ones of these, which I believe was in mid 2016 or so, I saw rare Pepe's on the counterparty blockchain. I was like, man, it's, it's just a matter of time before, you know, people purpose this for, you know, you, for art more broadly. And, and that actually happened in, in February of 2021. And we had this giant inflection and the NFT space kind of reached a um, GMV, the size of the global art market for a while. Now that market is consolidating and, and there's, you know, there's some maturing mm -hmm. that it needs to do. Um, but like AI and Web3 intersecting, that's yet another uh, example of how we were early to uh, particular trends. Like, like we made our first AI Web3 investment really in at the end of 2020, early 2021, which is WorldCoin. We did one in March of 22, which was Jensen AI, which had a nice confirmation last summer when they raised a $43 million round from, you know, Andreessen. Um, and now in 2024, like if you, if you had gone to East Denver, you know, every other presentation at East Denver is really about like the intersection of AI and Web3. Um, so that's being early. It's just using your insight to turn it into foresight, using your technical skills to understand what might become really prescient down the road. Long term means we want to be investing in things that produce a return on kind of a venture horizon, like five to 10 years, I guess, in crypto and not really indexing on those things that are flashes in the pan, like meme coins, um, you know, things that could reach like high valuation short term, but don't have a fundamental business like medium term. Like we really want to uh, build real value kind of over the long term. And right just means being correct about like the teams, the technologies, the strategies, the approaches that get these people to market and, and turn, uh, mm. you know, turn these projects into a success. And we've had a pretty good track record of being right. Mm. So there's this, uh, do you know Reagan, Regan or Reagan Bozeman at Lattice? Of course. Point? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so I, I actually, I don't know him, but uh, I, I saw this tweet. It says it is that he put out. Or she, I don't know who Reagan is, but um, in, in March yeah. that said, uh, it is widely accepted that the way to make money in VC is to be contrarian and right. This is absolutely false in crypto venture. All that matters is your ability to front run the narrative. And obviously that's hyperbolic and posted to, you know, get the, the Twitter algorithm going. But I do think that there's this interesting dynamic where, and it's one of the reasons actually, I think a lot of web two investors get wrecked doing crypto venture is because the main difference in the dynamic is in Web2 venture, there's a zero to one moment. There's the liquidity event, which is comes at, you know, maybe series E, F, G, whatever, several years in the company. It's an IPO or an acquisition. And it is you're right in your bet or you're wrong in your bet. You either make a bunch of money or you don't. And that's why you hear this typical thing of maybe you, you, you know, you bet on 20 companies and one only one makes it, but it returns the fund. That's the traditional venture model. In crypto, it's very different, right? You get that liquidity event oftentimes around the series A mark, maybe series B, but series oftentimes in year two or year three or something. So I think what Reagan's really saying here is like, the reason it doesn't matter if you're right long term is if you can just get if you can kind of front run the next the narrative that's going to be here in 18 to, tw to 24 months, you're going to make a lot of money. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, that on also this? that I also assumes that also assumes that you're exiting around maybe around that time. And what I'm kind of saying is, we are, we don't necessarily want to exit at that time. We want to have a horizon that is mm. a longer term view on the actual underlying, you know, business or or network or scheme or whatever whatever it is, um, to be a successful business long term. And um, I kind of disagree. Like, like I think I think that you can have the liquidity event around Series A, but 
you know, there's plenty of examples where you had that liquidity event and then the token sort of then just peters out and depreciates over the long term. And that's because founders were never really able to find product market fit or build, a, you know, a real business. And so one of the kind of North stars of coin fund is like, is like selecting teams that are building real things and not just indexing on kind of token economics, which by the way, I'm not saying that you couldn't make money doing that. And I'm not saying that aren't, there aren't like business, you know, investors who have that as part of their strategy. I'm just saying that from an early stage coin fund venture perspective, we want to be picking, um, you know, these like long horizon, uh, fundamentally mm. valuable things. You, you know, how, how do you guys, oh, go ahead, Seth. Well, we, we, what I was going to say on that is when we think about once the tokens are liquid, right? Because that's kind of the, the monetization opportunity. There, there's that saying that in the short term, markets are a voting machine. In the long term, they're a weighing machine. And like, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Like the, the fundamental analysis that we're doing on uh, liquid tokens in crypto, it rhymes with the fundamental analysis that I, I was doing in the equities world for 18 years. And when you think about the amount of trading that happens in crypto, and by trading, I just mean like how many hours a week the crypto markets are open. It's like five times. It's over five times what the traditional equities markets are, are open. So you're essentially having these dynamics play out in in hyperspeed, right? They're, they're playing out at like 5x the speed. And that, that's not entirely true because obviously like projects still have to ship stuff and you, you know, you'll have like a, a founder start to lose interest or move on. But it's also like because these are 24 seven markets, it takes that much more out of the teams and you need teams that are that much more hyper focused. And because it's like permissionless and global, um, it's that much more competitive. So I, I think you can you kind of can line that up and say, like, you're just playing this forward at like almost 5x the speed. And what we find is what, when you when you find the teams that are amazing teams that have real fundamental dynamics at play, the real fundamental momentum, those are the names that might go down with everything else. And, and they might go down a lot with everything else when you come into a drawdown. But then they're the, the tokens and projects that regain their highs and go to new highs even faster because they have real tangible um, progress because they, they're really doing important things. So um, I, I think in the end, like the short-term trading ends up being a lot of noise and, and that gets washed out when, when you look over the medium to long-term and that's our focus on the venture side and that's our focus on the liquid side. Mm. I want to I want to add one other thing, Jason, if that's okay, which is that I do think that there are key differences in you know between building like a crypto venture portfolio and a regular you know traditional VC portfolio, and I think that is because we're this is a different asset class, right? It, it is an asset class that, to your point, is uh, more liquid or becomes and has liquidity events sooner, and I think the result of that is. That whereas in a traditional portfolio, you know, you know the, the the wisdom, which is like you know, there's 25 companies and 23 of them go to zero and go out of business, and then you know, like one gets acquired and one returns the fund. Approximately, that is not the case in a crypto portfolio because of these assets. These assets aren't all zero to one. I mean, there are of course some opportunities in crypto. They're very like traditional equity opportunities that are zero to one. But when there's tokens involved, um, there's an opportunity to have like a middle outcome where it's like 0.5 <laughs> right and so what you so one key difference is that you actually see um you, you have more risk management capabilities in in this portfolio over time and you actually see a lower attrition rate uh because some mm -hmm. capital can be recovered because of liquidity and that's one difference and then the other difference is that mathematically you can actually build bigger portfolios in crypto and do better that is not the case in traditional venture because if you like a traditional venture, if you take your like 25 company portfolio to like a 75 company portfolio or something like that, right? And what happens is you push down the average position size and then that small percent of the fund um, that will return the fund can't return the fund because the position size is now smaller. 
But in crypto, because it's not binary and it doesn't have the same distribution, you can actually increase the diversification and then do better on average, like up to a point. Mm. Um, you can model this. Hmm. Let, let's, I want to understand that better. So in venture, I'm making up these numbers, but like, yeah, you 20 person, uh, 20 company portfolio, two of them exit, one's a acquisition, one's an IPO, the IPO returns the fund or something like that's mm-hmm. the, that's the model I'm making that up. Um, in crypto venture, if you have 20 portfolio companies, how many will you make money on? Well, this is what I'm saying is in a, in a crypto portfolio, then instead of doing 25 companies and you would do maybe like 40 or 50, right? And out of those, you'll have a lower attrition rate. So fewer of those will go to zero as compared to the traditional you know, venture portfolio. And so you'll, you'll make a kind of a better return. And then you can argue in crypto that kind of the more companies that you uh, get, like the more the more probability there is of getting that unicorn lottery ticket really um, partially because of the liquidity profile of the asset. So you get this like simultaneous lower attrition, better risk management and higher opportunity for like the upside across more opportunities that ultimately will probably result in crypto VC outperforming, you know, traditional VC and hedge Mm. funds and many other asset classes. How do you decide when to sell? Because I imagine this is a tough. So it, let, let's say um, let's say a traditional company, Web two company goes public. There's kind of this understanding. It's like you look. You've been supporting us for like ten years. Like I totally get it. You guys are taking chips off the table. Like r- mutual respect here. Like I get it. If you guys invest in a company and then you know they launch their token and it's two years into the business, they're like, "What the hell, guys? Like we're, we ju- we just began our relationship." So how do you yeah how do you make that decision? Well, I just want to say, like on the again on the on the venture side, we do take like a long term view, and we're not very like likely to actually sell something. I mean, I, mm. at, at the point of liquidity, right? Like I think back to um, Balancer, which was a, comp- a DeFi um, AMM Fernando. project yeah. we did in 20, 2019. and Balancer is actually one of those opportunities where yeah, they did have like an equity kind of component, but the purpose of the equity was just to convert the investors into token. And the, and the key asset of this network is token uh, driven and the value accrues in the token. And what happens was, um, you know, in the summer of 2020, they had their, you know, token launch and we were, we actually went more long, even though <laughs> we were kind of like um, early stage, like quote, quote unquote equity investors there. And, and we took a, you know, 10 year view to say, look, when DeFi matures, AMMs are going to be like key infrastructure, um, you know, serving trading based on DeFi. And now it's 2024. It's four years later. That has not quite happened yet, right? DeFi is, has not gone mainstream. You know, your friends and your friends' moms and, and parents and grandmas, like they're not using DeFi yet. So there's still, you know, a leg to go in the product market fit and maturity of the DeFi space. So we're going long here. Um, but... If there was a, I don't know, some kind of systemic failure, like someone realized, like Vitalik published a post and said, by the way, you know, all AMM curves are, you know, horrifying and um, they, they don't work. And here's the reason why. And this is like attackable and it's all going to go to zero. You know, there's there's more of an opportunity um, to to control for risk, in, mm. you know, in the, in this setup. And I'd also say that's that's not a, a one-off. That's actually something that we do quite often. Um, adding to adding to tokens, continuing to to support teams um, in a variety of ways on chain as the tokens start to trade. So we're we're usually thinking about uh, greater engagement as as they go liquid, uh, not not monetizing the moment they get liquid. How do you think about? using one fund for the value of another fund. So for maybe to, for like the, for as an example here, I would imagine the venture side could actually win more deals. If you're like, look, we've got this liquid book where we can actually come provide liquidity on, on your protocol. However, providing liquidity on the protocol might decrease the return of the liquid fund in which you have outside investors. So how do you make those kind of decisions? 
So for a situation like that, it, it would be the same fund that would provide liquidity. So we have uh, mm. different sets of investors across each of our funds, and there isn't a um, a, a dynamic where um, we we would want a totally separate fund engaging for the benefit of uh, one of our venture funds, one of our earlier funds. Um, but within a fund, that that's absolutely a benefit. And just from the knowledge that we have across Coin Fund, I mean, we have a trading team, right? So ty- that that's a result of having a, um, a a whole liquid discipline. And I think we have one of the best trading teams out there. Um, we we have all of the right connectivity. We do it all in a really institutional way. So um, it, it's something that we can do easily. Um, it's an expertise that we can bring to the table. And there's there's a lot of that. If Jake, you want to talk about our um, portfolio growth team and kind of the um, the the support that we give portfolio companies, it it really ties into all of these. Um, uh, different disciplines that we have at Coin Fund, but that that would be a conflict if we had one fund supporting another would, fund directly, and and we absolutely avoid that. I would say, in my experience on the venture side, there have been times when we had gotten venture deals, in part because we had a liquid fund. However, that's not because they necessarily wanted the liquid fund to, you know, trade their token or something like that, but it's rather the knowledge and expertise and like analysis mm. of like macro crypto markets and macro markets in general. And it's, um, um, it's, it, it's sometimes it's like expertise on things like treasury management that really helps um, kind of the venture view opportunities to also take advantage of the fact that we have a liquid fund without actually using liquid funds capital. And that's been powerful. Just the, the kind of the network effect and the knowledge that accumulates, the multidisciplinary knowledge that accumulates when you have a venture discipline and a liquid discipline um, could be powerful in crypto because, right, those assets are um, like the bread and butter of like what people are building. I'll, I'll give right. you another great. So, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add, like, I, uh, listening to this, I know a lot about the venture side of Coin Fund, and I we got teed up with the liquid side, and I know you've got this big liquid book, but like, can we, can you just tell us more about the liquid book? Like, is it, are you going, is it long only, long short? Like, are you putting on like hundreds of positions at a time? Is it very concentrated bets? Is it kind of swing trading? Are you making hundreds of trades a day? Like, I would love to, I just give us the lay of the land on the, just on, on, on what your guys' strategy is. Yeah. So, so just talking about uh, liquid investments in general at, at Coin Fund, we take a fundamental approach. So think of it as the, the type of underwriting that we would do on the, the venture side but doing it for, for liquid tokens. Um, and, and then you have the benefit of being able to sell out of those if it turns out that something changes with fundamentals and, and go into higher conviction liquid names at that new point in time. So it, it's really um, a, um, a, a part of the firm that, that looks a lot like traditional equities investing but doing it in in liquid crypto tokens and with with a very fundamental focus. What do you mean by fundamental focus here? So looking at revenue generation, looking at activity, right? If they don't have revenue yet, Mm -hmm. thinking about valuation, coming up with price targets, using um, a catalyst rich, developing a catalyst rich path to get to that price target. Um, the, these are all things that are just kind of the, the basic uh, blocking and tackling of uh, equities investing. And it, mm. it's funny, four years ago, um, what, when I joined CoinFund, we would be having conversations with investors about like, are, are there even fundamentals in, in crypto uh, tokens? How, how can you do fundamental investing? And I think that's like totally non controversial today. Like, people know you, you can go to, Token terminal, you can pull up a Dune dashboard. Um, you you can track what's happening with fundamentals. There's a really interesting dynamic that's starting to happen. So we've seen this continued evolution of markets where, again, four years ago, investors were saying, 
are there even fundamentals to, to crypto tokens? Aren't they all just about narratives and you, you know people buying the the token until it stops working and then selling it? Kind of getting into that um, the the front running the narrative thesis that that you were talking about a little earlier. Now we're finding. You, you know, you used to be able to generate alpha by finding inflections in on-chain fundamentals before they were priced into the tokens. Now we're finding those inflections in on-chain activity; those get priced in in real time. But you're you're mm. starting to see a dynamic where you have to combine what's happening in in the protocol in real time with what the team has talked about on. Uh, more qualitative catalysts, like they've been out talking about how they're they're going to do their V3 uh, upgrade, right? Well, here we are now, only a few months from it, and we're starting to see an inflection in V2 activity. And you kind of pull together this mosaic, and again, it's exactly the same way um, that that you do fundamental equities investing, but with the advantage hmm. of having direct access. It would be like. Having every company publish their uh, their daily P and L, right? So right. you're you're kind of seeing the same dynamic in real time, but then you're still like that would be priced inefficiently. If I told you like Amazon's P and L is published daily, like you know, point seventy two Citadel, all these guys would be pricing that in immediately, right? So you need to then understand the end markets that they're in. You need to understand what catalysts are coming up. You need to have your own view about how important those catalysts are going to be to meld that with what you're actually seeing on chain in order to come up with where where it's likely to trade over the next uh, nine, 12 months. Oh, man, that's really interesting. Um, Steph, I need to bring you into some of the product conversations at BlockWorks research that we're having. This is the exact. So actually, maybe we'll do this live. So one of the conversations that we're having at BlockWorks research and in, inside of our product which actually CoinFund was a, and Evan specifically was very, very, very early supporter of that. And I appreciate that a lot. Um, or is this question of fundamentals, right? Because there are two conversations we had here, I think. One is you can put as much fundamentals into this inter industry as you want. Things still do trade on these narratives, even though we have the belief, and it sounds like you guys have the belief that fundamentals will get more and more important, still narrative driven. The, but the other thing is there's no consensus around what fundamentals matter. And Fundamentals is kind of a made up thing in a sense until everyone agrees that this is the fundamental that matters. And then it and then fundamentals quickly flip to becoming one of the most important things in the industry. And you can see this in uh in 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 equities markets, right? There's maybe three to five metrics that everyone cares about more than anything else. What do you think those metrics are gonna be in in crypto? So it it's funny in equities, it always depends on the industry you're looking at, right? It, it could be EBITDA. It, it could be like if you're looking at like a, an unconventional uh, EMP, right, in the energy space, it could be um, the, the net asset value, right? The, the way that the market thinks about the value of their, um, their assets. And by the way, it could also be like an industry where everyone looks at some of the parts, right? There, uh, there are a few industries where some of the parts is really important. If it's like super high growth uh, tech, it could be a revenue multiple, right? So revenue is all that matters. No one cares about the fact that they're not profitable. If it's a more mature company, it could be like free cash flow yield. So there are all types of dynamics that, that are used for different industries. The key is understanding. So industry-wise, the key is understanding how all of the other investors are thinking about valuing those companies. So like EV to EBITDA is mm. usually important where... It's a growth industry, but you have balance sheet at play, right? If balance sheet is at play and they're continuing to like, they're generating cash flow, they're levering up their balance sheet, EVD EBITDA usually ends up being the way that people think about uh, valuation. Again, if it's high growth tech, mm -hmm. and, and at this point, no one cares about profitability because it's just like a battleground to get your, like to plant your flag. Well, then it's about a, um, a, a revenue multiple. So and then it's really hmm. interesting if you look at like a, a few specific names, like back when I was at Jenison, we owned we owned Amazon uh, back in uh, the the early days. And the analyst, I wasn't the analyst for it, but the analyst back in 2011, 2012, I remember 
talking to an analyst and another firm and they were like, you know, there's no way I could ever own Amazon. Like the, I, it, I just don't get the valuation, right? Like they're, they're not profitable. It doesn't make any sense. And our analyst was saying, you know what? I'm going to put Walmart's net margin on Amazon's revenue. I'm going to give it a higher multiple because they're growing faster. And guess what? Like it, mm. it got us to have a big position in the name, like absolutely killed it, but for all the wrong reasons, because it was never retail mm. that actually drove profitability. Yeah. It was AWS. It was the ad platform. But again, so you think about like ETH, what were the fundamentals on ETH back when people were buying it in like 2017, 2018, right? It was just that there was a lot of activity, right? It was showing product market fit for fundraising. Great, right? But like, there was no one five five nine, right? There, there was no like merge yet. In fact, like we we weren't even having like we we were still going through other scaling iterations of ETH, right? But there was a view that at some point this activity is going to translate into something that we can actually draw a solid line into valuation for, and that's that's where we are now with ETH. How do you, how do you value? Because uh, I don't even think the uh, the industry understands something like an L1. Like half the people, like Token Terminal is talking about like the, the P&L of, of ETH, like revenue and profitability of like Solana. And I'm like, that makes no sense. Like the, these things are commodities. We can't even agree. Like like in my mind, ETH and Sol, these are just, these are commodities. So you're not like, what's the revenue of wheat today? Um, or what's the, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the global capital markets, we're not like, what's the revenue of oil? Um, you're, you're well, probably you, like, you don't, oh, there's a you don't, supply you don't shop. Pay, uh, you don't pay transaction fees to bushels of wheat either, right? Like the, the, thing about, the thing about digital assets is that they combine, it, like the, their design space is much wider uh, and, you know, and more rich than traditional sort of securities or, or instruments. And so you get these hybrids, which are like, like some people say ETH is, is money, right? So ETH is money. Oh. Yes, it's also a commodity. Yeah. Yes, and it's also yeah. something that generates revenue at the same time. So, what do you call that? I mean, ETH, ETH is in a really interesting spot because stores of value tend to get much higher valuations, right? Like gold's overall value, right. gold's overall market cap is way higher than any individual equity, right? It's like fifteen trillion, something like that. So. If you think about like the addressable market for something like Bitcoin, when Bitcoin is just like digital gold, it, you could argue it, it's gold's market cap, right? And then gold's market cap is going to continue to go up as as we see the dollar devalued and other currencies devalued. But when you and by the way, like as Bitcoin gets more utility, maybe that will start to affect the ability to value it that way. Same thing with ETH. ETH has this like this dissonance where is it going to be valued like a tech stock? Because of the activity that it has, or is that activity through through one five five nine and the lower emissions from uh, from going to proof of stake, because you have contraction of supply when activity is picking up, is ETH going to have this like ultrasound money valuation, or is it going to have a, a valuation that's more based on um, on tech fundamentals and looked at like a uh, a tech stock, like a, a growth equity? Um, I think we're going to see how the market ends up uh, balancing those two dynamics, but they're like they're wildly divergent from a valuation mm. perspective because the biggest tech stock is what like three trillion, right? And then you have gold, which like does nothing, right? It, it's just a store of value at fifteen trillion plus. So, um, but mm. for for base layers broadly, right now we really just track activity, activity as measured activity. by you know. Primarily TVL, um, but but also looking at um, daily active users, transaction count. Like what you want to see is activity because activity has to be a precursor to monetization. And then the view is there, there are going to be plenty of ways to monetize. And and by the way, as we get regulatory clarity and we think we're on the path toward uh, regulatory normalization, that's going to allow for much clearer ways of passing value along to uh, to token holders and driving uh, valuation analysis. When let's say you have a thesis on something, do you spread that thesis that bet across uh, 
Let me get more concrete here. So let's say you really like um, like move. You're like move program programming language, good language. Okay, maybe we can make some venture bets um, on that side. But maybe Seth, you and your team says move is going to be this big thing that everyone's like. You know, maybe activity comes to the an L1 that's using move. Okay, so maybe venture side invest invest in like movement labs or something, and then you guys put on a trade for. I guess there'd be uh, Sui and Aptos would be the two you'd look at. Do you kind of like bet? the farm on one of those, or do you spread them across two? Well, first of all, there, there, there's definitely like a synergy in the research process, right? Because the technical due diligence for, you know, move or, or any other area of the technology um, is the same across um, venture and liquid. Um, but in terms, Seth, do you want to talk about like putting on positions? Yeah, I, I mean, again, like we're we're one firm that that's doing research on areas that we think are exciting. So that that to me is like the power of Coin Fund is the fact that we're having all these conversations, whether it's in our our morning meeting, whether it's investment committee, whether it's in our working groups, and and we're talking to all of these teams, right? The teams that are super early stage, the teams that are already liquid. So and. and by pulling together that view, um, like if if we're looking at liquid investments, well, yeah, we're limited to the the names that that are already liquid, and then you're looking at what their activity is. You're looking at what you think is going to come down the road, what their um, likely BD opportunities are, and then on the early stage side, we might be making an investment um, that that's um, much earlier stage that that might be either. Um, within an ecosystem of of one of the base layers that that's already out in liquid, or or it could be a challenger to them. So we're really like mm. creating this. Um, I, I'd say that this set of uh, ten to fifteen um, really well informed researchers in crypto that span liquid markets and venture markets. We're all bringing our own. Uh, perspectives, biases, areas that we're excited about, areas that we're less excited about. Um, and, and then that kind of works its way into each of the funds based on what the investable universe is, based on what, what time horizons mm. we're looking at and, and where the opportunity sets are. One, one recent one was a cross protocol, right, Seth? So we're doing like a lot yeah. of research on intense based bridging. Yeah, Hart was in our in our office in, uh, in in New York last week, and me and him we had this like whiteboarding session. We were at, like really deep into how um, you know basically like intense based bridging works, and it's really fascinating. It seems to be one of those um, approaches that like approaches optimality almost, right? Because in the sense of like having a low latency bridge, I think you can't really do better than a relayer network. And in terms of costs, you know, Hart has laid out ways in which they are um, optimizing the, the costs of the network. And there's also free market competition that is optimizing the fees, you know, for the customers. So you get this sort of like best of both worlds, lowest latency and like, you know, most free market optimized costs kind of protocol. Uh, and this protocol only has a liquid token, right? So... It's something that um, I, I believe, Seth, we're we're looking at in in, in the liquid fund. That's and right. It's something that we're we're thinking about holding in uh, in 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 a venture way in in the uh, early stage fund as well. Oh, so you could buy that fund, or you could buy it in both funds, basically. Yeah, and it, and it's a, it's a little bit of a unique opportunity because it's one of those protocols that only has. A liquid token. That's actually not the case most of the time. Uh, most of the time, we see something that has kind of an equity component and right. a token component. Well, I'd like right. AI and crypto, another area where uh, it, it, we we just did a lot of research on defining what the opportunity set was going to be on the liquid side. Right now, it, it's two things really. Right, it, it's proof of humanity with Worldcoin, and then a lot of it is some form of uh, of a compute network. So we were limited. We, we saw that this was a huge opportunity early, but we were limited on the liquid side on, uh, on how we could engage and found names that, that we really liked. 
um, on the liquid side. And then on the venture side, we're, we're seeing more and more sub verticals within AI and crypto really start to have um, teams come together and uh, interesting paths to, uh, to, to protocol launches and monetization emerge. This episode is brought to you by Monad. Monad's thesis is simple. The EVM is here to stay, similar to JavaScript and Web2, but unfortunately, today's EVM lacks the high performance and the scalability that developers need to make certain applications possible. Monad addresses these concerns and these bottlenecks while preserving seamless EVM composability for application developers. There's a seamless transition to Monad as the Ethereum RPC API allows for really easy portability. And for developers, Monad can support 10,000 real transactions per second with their unique parallel execution environment. And of course, there's full compatibility with EVM bytecode. Monad's internal DevNet is live. Public testnet comes out soon. You can join Monad's journey in two ways. One, go follow them. They're on Twitter, at Monad, M-O-N-A-D underscore X-Y-Z. And also join the Monad Discord. It's discord.gg forward slash Monad. Big thanks to Monad for sponsoring Empire. Hey everyone, Santi and I have been talking about Solana a lot recently and we're excited to have a Solana sponsor of Empire. Marinade is a staking protocol in Solana. I remember when they launched, I think it was back at the Solana Hackathon and they were funded with this 80K grant. It's super cool to see how far they've come. They're the only stake pool today that delivers auto rebalancing, MEV rewards, and automatic downside protection with their new protected staking rewards. You can stake natively or liquid stake with Marinade and get the same high performance delegation strategy that thousands are using already to stake your soul to over a hundred of the best Solana validators. Marinade has been live for over two years and they have audits completed by four of the top security firms in crypto. The delegation strategy is a first of its kind. So if you're staking your Solana, if you want to start staking your Solana, if you want to get some yield from your soul, start staking today with Marinade. Go hit the link in the show notes. Big thanks to Marinade for everything that they've done in Solana staking land. Go check them out. Go stake your Solana with Marinade today. With the overwhelming uh, disclaimer that this is not financial advice and all the classic stuff that's said on podcasts and YouTube and you know big stamp of not financial advice on this thing, is there anything else that you guys are looking at that you think is really interesting or that you guys really like? One thing that we've been in a in a multi year process on is uh, essentially like Ethereum scalability and interoperability, right? Like if you rewind, if you rewind Jake back to you know twenty. 2013, thinking about the future of blockchains, you know, he would say, um, I think there's going to be thousands or, or even millions of blockchains in the long term, and they're all going to be um, interoperating together in a very seamless uh, fashion, right? And that uh, there's a lot of people back in 2013 who were like, not on that page. They were like, no, 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 there's only going to be one blockchain and it's going to be Bitcoin and you don't really need anything else. And I think, I think my view. Um, pretty clearly sort of won out o- over over time. And we do see like thousands and even tens of thousands of blockchains in the market. And we see a ton of um, roll-ups on Ethereum. And we see a lot of uh, interoperability technology that's connecting them together. Now, what's, now where we're at with that is I think we've figured out um, a number of technologies that have dramatically scaled Ethereum already. Like if you want fast, cheap, high throughput, roll-ups and stuff like that, you have that today. What we're still kind of bad at is the interoperability part. There's a lot of you know, bridges, there's message passing um, protocols, but I don't think we've like achieved um, sort of the, the long-term state of the art of this, which is essentially abstraction. It's like, it's like when you are a smart contract developer, you just kind of like write your solidity and then you just deploy it to all of the EVM and like kind of like no matter which EVM network you're on, you're going to be able to interact with this with this smart contract. Another way of thinking of it is you're turning the Ethereum sort of highly uh, segmented market of rollups into something that really like to the developer feels like a monolithic chain at the end of the day. Um, and that, mm. I, I think that's kind of happening this year. Like we're seeing a lot of interoperability technology make uh, progress. There's Layer Zero, there's Hyperlane, um, there's others, they're doing very compelling things. And the reason that that's related to across protocol is I think that 
these relayer networks are finding a lot of um, applications in things like bridging, in things like interoperability networks, right? These are all related concepts that ultimately will create this like very optimal uh, layer uh, that at the end of the day just makes blockchains really easy to use for developers, abstracts kind of the backend, abstracts fees, abstracts accounts. And then we're in a world where uh, basically we have the web two experience, but with all of the advantages of web three, decentralization, permissionlessness, trustlessness, efficiency, lower counterparty risks, um, you know, things like that. So that's one area that we have been investing in and have been looking at and is moving, you know, very, very quickly. Uh, that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing that um, I like to mention, and especially this year, is that 2024 is really the first year where blockchain is truly converging with the with the traditional world. It's sort of funny to say because blockchain started in 2009, it's 2024, it's been like 15 years. But really, like the we're so early and the adoption is just starting now. And like historically, if you look at kind of crypto investors, there's been these two ends of the spectrum. There's been crypto investors who um, have taken a very like trad approach and they're like discounting digital assets and saying this is not real and this is not really going to go anywhere. And that has turned out to be very incorrect. And you have these, uh, the other end of the spectrum are saying like everything has to be decentralized. Everything is like a crypto anarchist uh, approach or, or it will fail. And that has turned out to be fairly incorrect as well. And I think where Coin Fund has done a good job is being realist about the fact that, you know, this is a technology and for the technology to succeed, it has to converge with the existing world, like, like digital assets and blockchains. They have to deal with governments and regulators and the SEC um, and the incumbents and competition from, from those uh, types of folks. And that's what's actually happening this year. Like we, are, we got the Bitcoin ETF on Jan 10. We, you know, we have heard Larry Fink say these are all stepping stones on the way to tokenization. We've had our portfolio company, Superstate, launch uh, their tokenization products. We're seeing a ton of RWA projects in the market. And what's happening is that like the more traditional people get access to blockchain technology through these traditional tokenization processes, the, the more like our life becomes easier, right? Because now... Google is running um, ads for Bitcoin ETFs. Huh, I wonder how that happened. Could it be that, you know, BlackRock called up Google and used their influence to, you know, democratize their, their ad process, right? And so we're going to see much more of that in different areas. Like the more traditional people are holding digital assets, the more it becomes in their interest to um, get them installed, right? And, and we're going to see uh, more adoption faster uh, starting this year. Yeah, I hadn't even thought of the fact that, yeah, now you can just run Google ads for these Bitcoin ETFs. I'm like, we've been trying to do that. Like if we ran a Google ad that was like Bitcoin conference, shut down for months. <laughs> right, just shut right. Down for months. Exactly. <laughs> like, and then it, it just takes the black. Uh, but now there's an investment product that you can, yeah, like, okay. But you can't buy a ticket to this conference. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Seth, what were you saying? No, I, I was going to say I kind of adjacent to that. When you look at the avenues for mainstream engagement, right? I, I remember after ETHCC last year, everyone was like, awesome, like another great conference for infrastructure, but where are the applications, right? And, and it was like, well, we're leaving them. We're saying the tech stack is more mature than it's ever been. And what does a more mature tech stack means? It, me it, means, it means you can put traditional Web2 developers out there. They can more easily develop applications and, and you can actually like start throwing that spaghetti at the wall and seeing which applications are actually going to get mainstream adoption. It started, um, I, I think, in um, September, October, um, when, when I was out at 2049, we were seeing in Singapore, we were seeing um, a lot of mainstream Web2 developers come into um, to Hong Kong come down to Singapore with the view that like now it was okay for them to come and develop um, in Web3. Mm -hmm. 
um, it, it was kind of the green light and we've had continued progress there. We, we now have a lot of talk of getting um, a Bitcoin and an ETH spot ETF launched in Hong Kong imminently, um, which I think is going to be an, another big catalyst there. And then when we think about base, right? So Coinbase is base, 110 plus million KYC users, another great avenue for bringing mainstream users um, across into more crypto native applications. And then even, even the ton ecosystem, right? You, you have 900 million monthly active users, uh, 200 million daily, um, a, a great resource for driving crossover engagement um, between the, the Telegram app. Those were the stats for Telegram. And and driving more penetration for um, uh, for for the ton blockchain itself. Hmm. This is actually maybe a good transition into this other topic I want to talk to you guys about, which is just market cycle. Um, yeah, just market cycle. And like Jake, you've seen more cycles than than most. So I'd be curious. Maybe the first question here is like, how will this cycle look different than others, yeah. and specifically related to this idea of the four year cycle? Well. This is a very interesting question because this is one. This is like the one cycle where I'm actually seeing a lot of disagreement and like bifurcation of views on how right. it will go. So for some reason, like you're saying, you it, didn't listen to the the Suzu Su Super Cycle idea last time. <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> well, I I kind of had the thought that well, first of all, when did the bull market start? I think a lot of people would say it started in November or maybe. Maybe some people would start counting on Jan 10 when the Bitcoin ETF gets approved. If you look at the, if you look at the technical charts, it's probably like, like November. Um, and then I had this idea, I'm not sure why exactly, but I had this thought that it, maybe it would be like a 12 month shorter bull cycle this time. And I was on a, um, I was on a spaces with Kathy Wood where she was talking about compressed cycle this time around. And then I did a Twitter poll and a lot of my followers on Twitter like more than 60% of them, I think, said, you know, this is going to be a 12, not an 18 or 24 month cycle. But then I was talking to like other people and other people are like, well, hold on. Like, what's the best analogy to this year? This is an election year. The last election year was 2020. It kind of came after a two year bear market, just like just like this year. And then what happened is it started to go up in 2020 and then mostly sideways. And then the real inflection happened in February of 2021, which I like to remember as the time when uh, NFTs went on uh, Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> so maybe there's an analogy to this election year where we're kind of like also, you know, seem to be going a little bit sideways now. Then there's some election uncertainty. And then once we get through that, maybe like we inflect in 2025. But I don't know. The best person on this call to ask that is really Seth. What do you think, Seth? <laughs> Well, yeah, if only so, we had somebody who's trying to time these markets here. Yeah. Exactly. No, look, I for me, base case is looking at prior cycles. And and prior cycles would say you have a good year the year before the halving, which happened last year. You have a good year the year of the halving, and then you have a blow off like massive year the year after the halving, right? That that's kind of like history repeats. But the interesting thing is those having cycles have always lined up with um, with macro cycles. And I think from a macro liquidity perspective, it's really unlikely. So real yield spiking up in November of 21 was what killed the cycle. And I think it's really unlikely sitting here today with the Fed saying in a bunch of different ways that they don't want real yields to go any higher. They want real yields to come down. I, I think there there's an interesting setup where you combine the fact that real yields are probably not going to spike higher again, the fact that we're on the path toward regulatory normalization, and that's something that like happens once in the life cycle of crypto, right? Actually having the, the definition of a regulatory regime over the next two, three years, and then add into the fact that everyone has PTSD, right? Everyone is like, oh my gosh, we're at 69K, at 70K, is this the P, right? Do I need to sell everything? Right. Like you're going to have this great wall of worry where every step up, there are going to be a lot of people who want to sell on the view that like that's been too much too fast. But then you have these immense flows coming from the, the ETF world 
that that are only just starting to kick off, right? You you have um, a, a bunch of um, financial advisory houses that have only just started to uh, to put on the ETFs. They put a bunch of restrictions, like you need 10 million net worth, uh, liquid net worth to be able to buy them. And that's all going to ease over time. And as that's easing, you're also going to have advisors saying, well, I put a half a percent of my, my client's assets in. Now I'm comfortable putting a point, putting a point and a half. So I, I think there's actually the, um, the the ingredients here for this to be an extended cycle. There's a, enough skepticism for sure. And you have that regulatory dynamic, the flows dynamic, and the macro dynamic liquidity. So I, I think there, there are a lot of really intriguing ingredients for an extended cycle. But, but say like base case, we have through next year still looking good. Um, but but there's like there's a really compelling case for that extended cycle coming coming together. Mm. So Chris Berniski tweeted his uh, little crystal ball says October 2025 is kind of equivalent to November 2021. Thoughts on that? But again, November November 21, I would define November 21 as. That was the moment that Powell said uh, inflation is transitory and then shifted that to, no, it's not transitory and we're going to start raising rates. So think about what, when he was mm. saying inflation is transitory, but inflation was accelerating up, that was max negative real yields, right? Real yields are nominal yields minus inflation. Right. So you had real, you had nominal yields at zero and inflation accelerating up, that gave you max negative real yields. So the moment that he pivoted and said, no, we're actually going to have to fight inflation, that was when real yields started moving higher, and then they ended up spiking higher. So so I look at that that analogy, and it's like, it, it's analogous when, when you're working from a um, positioning, uh, temporal positioning after the halving, but it's like night and day versus um real yields at hmm. least as far as things look now i mean we haven't even done the first cut hmm. november 21 is the the peak of the last bull right that's what you're yep. saying november 2021 yeah. was uh the first break point solana right. in lisbon when nobody could lose money if they if they tried and then, <laughs> then it was and then everyone there. could <laughs> And then we all lost a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But no, like the, the real yield environment, at least as it looks today, is totally different. Now, gosh, if we're if we're at like 500 k Bitcoin, a million Bitcoin, and inflation is accelerating wildly, and we have a new regime, we have a, a new government in place, and they're like, look, like we need to start in fighting inflation again. And they start like maybe that does create the the same setup. But but that's not where things uh, what what things look like right now. Hmm. Do you is, do you think there'll be a time in the next like? So how do you how does this then impact your um, strategy on the liquid book? Because let's say you're retail like let's let's say inside of Jason's head, there's a thought that okay, I've seen a couple of these cycles before. Maybe it makes sense. Like historically, I've just never sold my like I've just been like I'm never selling my Bitcoin or ETH. Like that's just a ridiculous thing to sell it. And I'm like, maybe you try to time it. Um, and maybe that's a fool's game, but maybe you try to time it a little bit um, so that you don't have to experience these nasty 90% drawdowns. Um, but, but, you're that... saying, but you're saying you're saying that now because of the nasty drawdown that we went through in 22? The nasty drawdown in 22, in 22 and in 18 and 19. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's like that PTSD that I was talking about where it's like, Everyone is now so conditioned, like maybe I will sell some, right? Maybe I will like try to like take some of that off the table so that I don't have to like, I went through that pain in 18. I went through that pain in 22, like maybe. And, and that's what, that's what actually creates that wall of worry, right? That creates the, I, I mean, one hmm. of my, one of my really good friends, my mentor, um, I remember in late 16, early 17, at one point he was like, man, like, Bitcoin's actually come back. I'm going to sell, right? And like he sold 
the maximum amount that he could withdraw from uh, from Coinbase at the time. I think it was like 25000 or something, right? So he sold that and he withdrew it. And then the next day, his account was back up to the, the same amount pre-withdrawal from, <laughs> from the day before. And he was like, all right, I'm going to sell again and like withdraw it and did yeah, the same thing the next day. On. And then he was like, shit, I need to be buying, not selling, right? And he he put it all back in. And that's kind of, that's the wall of worry in like a, a really like tangible example, yeah. right? It's people selling, it keeps going up. And then those people coming back in and realizing, no, I shouldn't be selling, I should be buying. That's what creates that continued climb in the market. It, it's when you, you don't have exuberance, you have fear. And that fear is what's causing people to sell prematurely. So again, like we're still far off from that. Yeah. But I get. I know we're so far off from that. I would agree with that. Do you? What I'm trying to get at is this question of will will this cycle look the same or different? And in my mind, there's like the same would be like big blow off top in 2025, basically like some ridiculous like newcomers can't even fathom what this thing looks like. Some ridiculous blow off top in 2025, followed by like a pretty nasty drawdown in 26 into like you know, just peak apathy in 2027. That's like if this follows all the last cycles. In your mind, Seth, do we do we get that really nasty drawdown? Like, or is there or is there a chance that we just we're out of this four year cycle period? So so my base case is is that we get that, right? Because I, I think in crypto yeah. in particular, history repeats, which by the way, like we, we should spend a minute on what December 2020 would say about the the current setup right now, because December 2020 was when we went through 20,000. And, and when we decisively broke 20,000, we went to 40K in three weeks, right? We doubled in three weeks. So I, I like thinking about um, historical uh, experiences in crypto, I think it's really important. And that would definitely say, like, be prepared for a blow off move higher in the back half of 25 and then downside. But you always want to think about what the counter could be. What are the what are the emerging cases? And without a doubt, the the emerging case with regulatory normalization, with liquidity dynamics that look different today, and with all of these new investors that can come in through through the ETF, um, there's a growing case that this could actually be the the super cycle. In fact, I I'd say if it weren't for Powell raising rates aggressively, now we had inflation, right? So so he he felt he had to take action. But if it weren't for Powell raising rates aggressively. I, I think we would have actually had that that super cycle play out. Mm. And, and that wasn't crypto specific, right? That wasn't a crypto driven cycle. But in some ways it was, right? Because why was crypto going up so much? Because real yields were so negative. So I, I keep coming back to like this macro mm. question and what's happening with liquidity, what's happening with real yields. It's the same thing for, for unprofitable tech stocks. It's the same thing for... Um, the the mag seven, except for maybe um, the the ones that that are like most closely tied to direct AI um, participation. So kind mm. of a non answer, but like I I think no, it's an yeah, like that. You you always want to think about liquid markets in like a probabilistic way, right? Like because we 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 don't predict the future, right? You're you're kind of thinking about what are the probabilities of different outcomes playing out, and I would say base case is like that cycle has been consistent. Obviously the N isn't that big, but that cycle has been consistent. So you're going to assume that that cycle continues, but at the same time, there are all of these compelling reasons to say, maybe it doesn't. Right. And we're going to be like hyper vigilant around the potential for it to, uh, to not play out the same way that, that it has in the past. Yeah. Jake, maybe we can move on to the next topic in a sec, but, um, just to round out this conversation on the cycle, like any any other thoughts on just like how how this looks the same and or different in these four years, you know, four year cycles and what you what you plan on doing personally and yeah, I guess any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is going to be different in the sense that it'll like I believe this is going to be the biggest sort of bull cycle we've had in crypto, and part of the reason is just natural growth, uh, more and more and more people. 
um, are sort of onboarding to the space. You know, WorldCoin is doing eight to 10 million uh, signups, uh, annual run rate right now. Um, obviously, Bitcoin is enjoying tokenization, ETFs, convergence with, with uh, the traditional world, as we've discussed. And so um, I think that's not to be underestimated. I think we're going to be more, more mainstream than we've ever, uh, we've ever gone. What am I doing personally? I'm not, I'm not trading meme coins and spreading my capital across many different tiny things. I'm, I'm actually, um, I think most of my PA is concentrated in something like 11 uh, positions that are high conviction, long-term oriented and, and, and larger. Um, and of course, some of those are Bitcoin, Ether, uh, and, and so forth. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not trading meme coins this cycle. But by yeah, the way, one, yeah. one thing that I would point out, if you think about that regulatory normalization, right, like we're all talking about the potential for that to, to drive things higher on a, a secular basis. Think about like your DCF model, right? And you have your discount rate. Well, when you start to get regulatory normalization, when you get a regulatory regime, what does that mean? It's that the space becomes lower risk as an investment, right? So that means that the discount rate that you would use for the space is going down. So that's like a one-time step up in, in valuations across the space. And that's like an interesting way. Like I don't use DCF, so I'm a growth investor, but it's an interesting like traditional financial way of thinking about what a regulatory regime, what diversified end markets, what more convergence with traditional finance, how all of that flows into um, actually justifying higher valuations for for the space and lower volatility yeah. over time yeah maybe we can pivot to talking about ai and crypto a little bit more um so jake you when i think about people who have been calling for ai the kind of convergence of ai and crypto there's uh earlier than anyone else there's a few names three to five names that come to mind right folks like Ilya from near other people and, and and you're one of those we've gone from at least personally in my head being like, oh, we're slapping these two things together now. This is ridiculous. Too, it is now one of the AI and crypto is now one of the five big themes of permissionless this year. So I have completely turned on that. I'll say and, and looking at some really interesting stuff. And now more and more empire content is AI. I'm like, wow, all right. So this is this is how it happens. I'd be curious to get your kind of lay of the land. I know I think Seth, you mentioned proof of humanity and one other thing. What is the um like? If you were talking to someone who maybe didn't know too much about crypto and didn't know too much about AI, how would you lay out like why these two, why we need these two things to, to come together and like how these two worlds will converge? Well, imagine that you, I guess like the thought experiment is like, imagine if you let AI just be developed by, uh, by big tech, which is kind of the default path, right? What does that world look like? It looks like a world where, all the models are proprietary and monetized to the satisfaction of those companies. It looks like a world where um, GPT, excuse me, GPU and other compute um, supply is totally constrained and bottlenecked by companies like NVIDIA, Meta, you know, OpenAI, and are not really like accessible to anybody else. It looks like a world where um, there's some really irresponsible regulation or legislation passed around licensing which i think in, in effect makes the models like more um opaque uh not as transparent as, as you'd want them to be for for safety reasons it's a world where data provenance is not really taken into account and these big techs are you know profiting from training models out of you know of out of copyrighted material and uh and you know kind of originators and creators aren't getting compensated fairly um and on and on and on so i think like you know, not, you don't need specifically Web3 to solve that problem, but it feels like Web3 is the best technology um, to, to solve that, uh, that problem today. And so what is, what does that intersection look like, at least from CoinFund's perspective? Well, there's this pipeline that creates AI products. It's basically the talent, the data, the compute, um, and the productization uh, like of AI models. And I think what Web3 adds to, to that picture is that it democratizes and opens 
every single one of those stages in the pipeline. So for example, we now have decentralized network to networks today that are serving um, GPU capacity uh, for things like training and inference of models. And in fact, um, there are real AI apps like Web2 AI apps that today are running on decentralized Web3 uh, compute, which is really, really cool. Um, we have um, like, why should a scientist have to work at Google if they have an idea for a new model framework and they need some compute in order to test it out? Why can't we have models that are like crowdfunded and owned by token holders that rival the state of the art models like GPT four or five as it's about to come out? Um, you know, and, and then finally, um, like the safety issue for me is, is paramount. Like, I think that um, if you want AI to be safe, then absolutely the wrong approach is to say only like a few proprietary, closed, opaque things can develop AI. The correct approach is to make it transparent. Like if, if I were the, you know, the president or whatever, and I could issue an executive order, my executive order would be that whenever open AI um, creates a new model, they have to open source the weights because that's going to be like the best way to actually get transparency into, uh, you know, into play and to actually know um, that what open AI is creating is not, is not dangerous. And when open AI says that, mm. or, or other, uh, you know, AI companies for that matter, when they say like, we're going to solve the safety problem internally, what they're really saying is that like, you know, 10, 50, a hundred people are going to be working on this problem. And we know right, they're really very, saying we're going to put our own San Francisco bias on whatever, uh, right. on whatever and this algorithm should be. Yeah. It's, it's just so clear that, um, that LLMs, for example, in the long term have to be localized because they have to take into account yeah. local language, local culture, uh, local biases, right? And, you know, it just, it's not realistic to have these like monolithic AMMs that are trained in San Francisco and then applied and, and sort of thrust upon the rest of the world. That's just not how the world is going to work. It's not realistic. And that's what Web3 enables is a world where that whole pipeline can be used in a democratic manner. Do you think it's, uh, tell me if I'm stretching the uh, comparison <laughs> too far here, which I very, very well might be, but do you think it's fair to say people used to think you were mentioning there, there used to only be one chain, like it was all going to get built on Bitcoin. And then, you know, Jake and CoinFund had this idea that there'd be thousands of chains. And now that this is, has kind of played out and there's thousands of chains now there, I feel like uh, you talk to folks in AI land and they're like, all AI is going to be controlled by like three or four people. There's like the Microsoft AI, Alibaba AI, Apple AI, Google AI, and that's it. And to me, it's starting to become like just hearing you and talking to other folks who are smarter than I am. Uh, it feels increasingly obvious that there will ultimately be thousands and probably millions and tens of millions of AIs as well uh, of, of these, yeah, I guess, localized LLMs, like you called them. Is that a, maybe I'm trying to draw the comparison too far, but what do you think of that? I think it's inevitable. There's this great, like, if you know Jan LeCun, who's the head of AI over at Meta, he had yeah. this recent episode on Lex Friedman, and he has this great quote. I'll read it to you now. It says, the French government will not accept that the digital diet of all of their citizens uh, will be controlled by three companies in the West Coast of the U.S. That is just not acceptable. It's a danger to democracy, regardless of how well-intentioned those companies are. And it's also a danger to local culture, to values, and to language, right? So I just... I, wow. I and, and the fact that like coupled with the fact that we actually see in the market real innovation and in fact, most innovation um, really happening in open source. Now, the, the big tech companies, they still control like right at this moment, they still control a lot of the compute and they kind of have the power to create like, the biggest, you know, foundation models. But the secondary waves of innovation of how to like how to compress those models, how to make them more efficient how to, um, you know, fine tune them, in, in, you know, in tractable ways, how to put them on commodity hardware, how to put them on quantum computers, like a lot of those um, innovations are happening out in, in open source. And I think that mm. there's a point where once we source enough compute in Web3, once we, once we start to do like crowdfunding of, uh, you know, of training 
uh, we're going to see like an inflection point where we're going to actually surpass uh, proprietary tech. Will your so one of the so AI has impacted white collar more than people thought it would impact blue collar. Like Andrew Yang and stuff was like blue collar is going away AI, but really it's impacted white collar um, more than blue collar. I'd say. Have you thought about how your job could ultimately replace be replaced? I guess Seth and Jake. <laughs> I mean, listen, I play around with a lot of uh, like state of the art AI. Most recently, that's been. Uh, generating music on suno uh, AI, which is really, oh, really fun crazy cool. experience so amazing good. so yeah, good. yeah yeah and i get the distinct sense that you know at least for a while these are going to be tools that augment what we do you know i think um there might come a point where there's agi i don't think we're like anywhere close to that right now and if you actually listen to jan lacoon on lex he goes into some really compelling reasons like why we're not really that close and that's someone that you should like listen to on this topic Hmm. i it's interesting i think there's some really um there's some really when i think about liquid markets and the ability of of ai to take over uh liquid portfolio manager roles um there are some really interesting nuances that that one has to think through basically like it, it's kind of the biases and the foibles of humans that create the market right imperfect information that creates the the mispricings and how that kind of feeds into like if if there is an answer out there and a whole bunch of different ai bots are able to come to that answer then what does that mean for for liquid markets that they just like price in like to to perfection what's happening today immediately like there there's always going to be the room for um multiple market participants so it, it's it's something that i spend a lot of time thinking about but it's like a very like non trivial um dynamic like how ai interacts with market pricing um but there is like a really interesting, you know, when you talk about it, like Jake and, and you're talking about AI augmenting, um, I think a big thing that the Fed is focused on, a, a big thing that will impact global economies just in the next year, forget like five years out, is the productivity gains and the disinflationary impact from AI. I think it's going to come way faster than people realize. And that's kind of why the Fed, like that could drive the super cycle. Because if you're the Fed and you're saying, look, last decade, we couldn't get any inflation despite QE and zero rates. And now we're going to have like potentially the most productivity generating. I mean, Jamie Dimon today was saying this is as important as the steam engine, right? Like the most productivity generating technology in generations coming in an accelerating way over the next year or two. Like, is your bias going to be that like, this could like that that we could get into like an inflationary environment again really quickly and you need to like be tight on rates or is it going to be man like we could have a big disinflationary dynamic coming into play really quickly and and we need to like keep liquidity out there keep things uh financial conditions loose um like i i think that's probably going to be yeah. the way that the fed thinks about it by the way it's so cool watching everything get dark outside while we're talking oh, the yeah. <laughs> it is cool it is cool i'm in uh i'm in san francisco today so ah. I'm I, I can't see it, but I've got, I, you can see you can see a little bit of it um that's cool uh <laughs> seth i think your face you have a good face for uh the future of the super cycle like i think seth, <laughs> seth Gims, the super cycle guy this is the first podcast i've heard super cycle i like it i like it when this happens i'm gonna be like seth told me so, um <laughs> yeah with ai actually it was uh Ilya from near who was um and then uh rune uh, Rune from Maker. Um, well, I was talking to him about, at DAS about this, and then Ilya on another podcast a couple months ago about like this idea of, for for me at least, and at Blockworks, like I really do think that having an, like an AI COO internally would be incredible for the company and for for all companies. And I'm just kind of waiting for someone to build this where, you know, it'd be up to the founder, to the exec team, or whatever to like, do you want to opt in or do you not want to opt in? But if you opted in, like, imagine something that sucks in all the Slack conversations around the company, every email around the company, and someone before they go to someone can basically say, Hey, look, I'm trying to do X. Like, 
should I do, you know, it's, it's, I don't, I, I just think that there's something, I could see it being a very cool B2B thing. Jake, Seth, I know we're at time. This has been awesome, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, a lot more that we could have discussed, a lot more that we wanted to discuss. So we'll have to have you guys on again soon. And yeah, we'll see you. Uh, Jake, I think you're already scheduled to speak at Permissionless, maybe, or Seth, you are, or can't, can't remember which one of you guys, but as always, we'll get the Coin Fund folks involved. So look forward to seeing you. Okay. Thanks so much for All having right. us. Thanks, Jason.